This episode of All Things Reconsidered is supported by The Sound Syllogism, your source for true premises and valid conclusions. Visit peterbogosian.com to learn more. I'm Peter Bogosian. Welcome to our third episode of All Things Reconsidered, where we consider what in the world happened to NPR. If you missed the first or second episode, you can find links in the description. Today, Matt Thornton and I sit down again to analyze two NPR stories. Matt is owner of Straight Blast Gym and author of The Gift of Violence. The first story we look at is about dinosaur emojis. Yes, you heard that right, dinosaur emojis on NPR. The second story is NPR's hard-hitting look at Antifa. Just kidding. It's NPR's compassionate and supportive look at Antifa. Former public media journalist Gina Gamboni joins us again for Morning Sedition. And as usual, we start with comments from former NPR listeners about why they stopped listening and supporting NPR. Time for another segment of I Stop Listening to NPR When. Today, we're going to hear from three new individuals, Scott, Malcolm, and someone who's anonymous. Let's take a listen to Scott, see what he has to say. Hello. Um, Yes, NPR. Um, As you probably all can tell, I'm old enough to have been listening to NPR as an adult in the 1980s, 90s, and 2000s and enjoyed it immensely. All Things Considered, Morning Edition, Garrison Keillor, Car Guys, Terry Gross. I had many driveway moments, as they say, and if you don't know what that is, please Google it. But I began to notice it was starting to become something that it wasn't. It started out maybe as a compassionate move but suddenly metastasized into a, something else that just wasn't enjoyable or informative anymore. Um, and my broader point is that I don't want to pick on NPR solely. I think across the American media landscape, on the right, we have one form of poison that's just no longer worth listening to. And on the left, including NPR, we have a different form Um, And it seems a little divide and conquer, and uh, America is being divided where it used to maybe not be so much. My recommendation to us all is if you know a well is poisoned, not only do you not drink from it, but you try to encourage others to not drink from, from it. And our American media is poisoned in different flavors across the landscape left and right, and even, unfortunately, center. And uh, I think we all should just stop consuming those sources, but instead, well, at least thank God for Substack. Thank you. Thank God for Substack. Truth. So the larger problem here is with legacy institutions, legacy media. That's why I think this new crop of independent journalists like Barry Weiss, I have a Substack, et cetera, where... There's also a, there's also a danger to that, but people used to trust our legacy institutions. They no longer do. What's particularly insidious about NPR, however, is the federal funding and the funding mechanism. So we're going to talk about that as the show goes on. Uh, but I think Scott hits on s- something really interesting. You know, a, another theme that we've seen is that it's it's something else, but it's not informative. Mm-hmm. It's actually un- it's actually misinformation, as we've spoken. He about. compared it to right wing media, and I think that's correct in one sense. In that le- NPR is certainly left wing media. I think it's different in another sense. It's a little more pernicious. In that, if I turn on Sean Hannity on Fox News, mm. I know I'm going to get far right, conservative point of view. And that's good to Hannity's him. credit, he doesn't make any. He is not kidding. I mean, he doesn't pretend he's not that. He is an advocate for the right. If you want to know what conservative right wing people think, you can turn on Sean Hannity. The problem with NPR is the entire channel, the entire news team is like that. And they have a an air about them 
where they're uh, assuming to be objective Ind journalists. Independent, yes. Independent, right. objective journalists. They're not supposed to be, or, or, or at least they're not honestly saying that, hey, I'm advocating for the f uh, position of the far left here. And that makes it more dangerous, in my opinion, because if you watch the New York, if you listen to the New York Times or you read the Washington Post, you want to have objective journalism. And if that objective journalism is actually propaganda for the right or the left that's masked as being objective journalism, that's more dangerous than somebody who's a pundit who Spot openly on. declares their political points of view. Right. Spot on. All right, let's take a listen to Malcolm. You ask, when did I stop listening to NPR? Well, I can't say that I've stopped completely, but I have stopped contributing to them in the way that I used to. I finally got tired of listening to every single story at our local affiliate, as well as for NPR being about race, period. I recognize that race is an important issue, as are all sorts of other issues, but it's not the only important issue facing America today. I'm hoping that at some point they'll get back to general news coverage rather than covering everything about race with the occasional foray into LBGTQ plus uh, type of coverage. So this is something we hear over and over again. And I'd be willing to bet that if NPR did its own independent poll of its listeners and found out why people who have stopped listening stopped listening, this would rank right at the top. Yeah, and so they don't, so we have to do it for them. Mm -hmm. right? So that was Malcolm an eminently reasonable human being. And here's an anonymous. Here's someone who wishes to remain anonymous. Let's see, with a mask and sunglasses and all. Let's see. Hello. I can't show my face, unfortunately, because I need to protect my identity. Um, commenting on your question about why I stopped watching or reading NPR. Previously, NPR used to have very insightful stories that covered issues uh, which weren't covered by the mainstream news or covered those issues in a way that was unique and insightful. Um, currently, and for, uh, for a while, they have uh, consistently covered news in a way which is extremely biased, extremely aligned with a woke, leftist, democrat, progressive agenda which is extremely biased and very unhelpful to many people. For example, today they have a story that says the end of Roe v. Wade raises fear of more prosecutions for pregnancy loss. Uh, in the story, they talk about a woman who was imprisoned for losing her baby. They don't mention anything. If you do very basic research, you can quickly find out that this woman was a methamphetamine addict and when the baby was born the baby was born to have was when the baby was born dead the baby was found to have drugs in its blood they don't mention anything about this the story is extremely biased extremely misleading and just promotes a very anti republican anti conservative agenda so it's it should not be funded by taxpayers any longer because it's so one sided that's a sad story, yeah. um, and yeah. it's also it's deeply, deeply dishonest, yeah. and I have no doubt he's telling the truth. I think it also it's also sad. I don't doubt that he does need to remain anonymous, but isn't it sad that you have to remain <laughs> anonymous that, yeah. because you're talking about NPR? Like, what does that yeah, tell you about Yeah, because you're talking culture? about facts and evidence. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, that's how divided we are as a culture, and I think in large part, as we've seen, we can thank NPR for that. Yeah, one more thing that struck me about this, a theme that's emerged again in these we hear from people all the time. If you, When you conduct what he said was very basic research, really simply looking into the story that they don't, they it's, don't cover It's quite themselves. a thing to overlook, the fact that the baby was born dead because it was filled with drugs in its system, and that's why the woman was in jail as opposed to abortion laws. Right. Like, those are two completely different right. stories. That's complete and total dishonesty on the part of NPR. Right. There's no way around that. I also think it's interesting, too, for people who might think that NPR, we keep referring to it as the left, but they're not really carrying any kind of counterculture narrative. NPR is carrying the international corporate narrative. 
This is the narrative of Apple. This is the narrative of every big multinational corporation out there. They love this uh, woke ideology because it's an unfixable problem, systemic, and there's, there's, they'd much rather talk about that than they would class-related issues and, and having to pay people more or, or any real thing that right. they could make. Right. They can just make a few token changes and put a BLM sticker on and, and get off the hook. So, you know, international corporate corporations love this agenda, and NPR is pretty much their lapdog yeah, at this they, point. They love the agenda in the U.S., but they don't have gay pride in anywhere in the Muslim world, right? They, they love the agenda in specific places like right. here. Thanks to Scott, Malcolm, and our anonymous guest. If you would like to submit videos for when you stop listening to NPR, just look directly into the camera and be sincere and just tell people, why did you stop listening to NPR? When did you stop listening to NPR? How did you feel? Was it a, a particular story? There'll be a link in the description and you can... Uh, submit your videos at peterbogosian.com, P-E-T-E-R-B-O-G-H-O-S-S-I-N.com, and we will use those for the second series. It's all helpful. It's all helpful, so thank you. And now, we hear from award-winning journalist, producer, and former host at NPR affiliate stations, Gina Gamboni. Like one of the commentators we just heard from, Gina also believes the media landscape is poisoned and NPR is a big part of the problem. Here's Gina with Morning Sedition. There is a very old epistemological tale about a small group of blind men who come across an elephant. Each man feels a different part of the elephant's body and believes he knows the truth of what the creature is. Each man is correct in a way. But none knows anything near the truth of the full elephant. <laughs> the idea of objective journalism has fallen out of favor with many journalists at NPR and at public media stations. To be fair, objective journalism might be a myth. To be objective, you have to remove yourself, your viewpoint, from a situation. The way I've approached being objective is to think... What would be true if I didn't exist? That means my feelings didn't exist, my opinions, my biases, my experience, etc. It's a good thought exercise, but it's also impossible to complete. I can't conceive of what would be true without my own mind in the mix. I'm using my own mind to consider it. It's like asking, what would I look like without my face? I believe in objectivity as an attitude toward reporting, an aim or a direction. But I do agree with journalists who reject it as something that can be fully accomplished. I disagree with journalists who embrace lived experience as a replacement for objectivity. A better replacement is what some journalists call depth and breadth of reporting. An even better word for me is thoroughness. If we acknowledge that we can't fully detach ourselves from our own minds, we can do our best to represent reality as accurately as possible by including other minds, even minds that see things differently, like interviewing all of the blind men who came across the elephant in the old tale. Even getting all those guys together to discuss their findings, that's science. NPR doesn't do that and doesn't encourage journalists to do that. When an organization becomes saturated with an ideology, reporting on the whole elephant becomes a problem. So what we often get from NPR is deep reporting on a singular aspect of a story, while the whole story is completely ignored. This is on display in the next segment when Peter Bogosian and Matt Thornton discuss a story about the relationship between the transgender Twitter community and the dinosaur emoji. The journalists who produced this story surely felt they did their job. They conducted a lengthy interview with a trans woman and spoke with a specialist from Emojipedia, providing some real world information about how emojis are born. But the story is an absolute failure because it wasn't thorough. It didn't provide the necessary background listeners need to understand what actually occurred. Peter and Matt are going to talk about the story itself, but I'm going to give you some background about dinosaurs and transgenderism that you won't learn in the piece. Here we go. We start in Great Britain. 
Rosie Duffield is a British Labour Party MP. Duffield has been in disagreement with other members of the Labour Party about the rights trans women should have. Duffield says she supports the rights of trans people to live freely as they choose, but she does not support male-bodied biological men to access protected spaces for biological women. She tweeted this on September 10th, 2021. Duffield was being criticized for her so-called radical feminist beliefs about women much earlier. In August of 2020, Duffield tweeted that only women have a cervix in response to a tweet using the phrase people with a cervix instead of women. Note, radical trans activists call people who don't believe trans women should have full access to women's protected spaces, TERFs. If you think it's correct to say women instead of people with a cervix, you would also be called a TERF. TERF stands for Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminist. It means you are a feminist who doesn't include trans women in the definition of women. Back to September of 2021. The Labor Party had a conference and Duffield said she was not attending because of abuse and threats she received online due to her stance on women's protected spaces. At that conference that Duffield did not attend, another member of the Labor Party, David Lammy, said people with feminist beliefs like Duffield are dinosaurs. Yes, he called them dinosaurs. Again, that was in September of 2021. People who support Duffield's view about protecting biological women from male-bodied biological men embraced Lammy's insult and started using dinosaur emojis and dressing up as dinosaurs at protests. On October 8th, 2021, the British medical journal, The Lancet, received a visit from protesters dressed as dinosaurs. The protest was about The Lancet's use of the phrase bodies with vaginas in place of saying women. The dinosaur protesters also visited the Labour Party headquarters. Comments from David Lammy of the Labour Party in September of 2021 were the source of radical feminists taking on the dinosaur as their symbol on the street and on social media. It wasn't until October 18th that the dinosaur emoji was declared the property of trans people after Lammy's comments in September and after the dinosaur protests. You won't hear any of this background information in the story you're about to hear. Instead, the story paints a picture that TERFs took on the dinosaur emoji just randomly in order to harass people who are trans. Granted, this story is ridiculous in all kinds of other ways and also just idiotic. But leaving out the key part of the story that explains why feminists started using the dinosaur emoji and dressing up as dinosaurs. This is how people become misinformed. Next time on Morning Sedition, I'll talk about the difference between public radio and NPR. <laughs> Now that Gina has told us what the story is actually about, let's take a listen to how NPR portrays it. Dinosaurs are back on the big screen. Jurassic World Dominion is now in theaters. Young kids always seem to love dinosaurs, and maybe we all do, as we crowd into natural history museums to see them in all their bony glory. But did you know that the dino emoji is beloved in LGBTQ plus online communities? It's true. So it was a... It was upsetting for those individuals when the emoji started appearing on the feeds of an anti-trans community. Amory Sievertson and Ben Brock Johnson from the WBUR podcast Endless Thread pick up the story. So to understand this dinosaur emoji story, we thought we should start with a little dinosaur knowledge. I'm a science journalist and author. So that's what he thinks that one needs to understand the story. Yeah, now that they've actually seen what the story is about. When we first heard this, we had absolutely no idea what to even say about this story because there's <laughs> no content here that, that's really in any way meaningful. It's just a like a petty revenge story from, you know, something silly. But with that context, it actually makes sense. But we'll see if NPR even brings it up. Yeah, and I remember we, we were looking at each other utterly mystified. I've written books like Skeleton Keys and The Last Days of the Dinosaurs. This is Riley Black. Riley loves her some dinos. 
Now, she digs for fossils professionally. She writes about it. She tweets about it. Online, she exists in multiple worlds and multiple dinosaur communities. A lot of it is very professionalized. People talking about their new papers and new studies coming out and their latest field expedition. There's also a broader community of... Again, it amazes me that they think that this is the requisite knowledge to understand the story. Or they don't even think it. They're just portraying it as such. Dinosaur and paleontology enthusiasts, people who just like to know more or they were inspired by Jurassic Park and they want to find out the real stories behind these animals. And the number of paleo artists on social media right now is astounding. Like when people talk about... If you look through some of this paleo art, it is astounding. But within this group of dinosaur artists and enthusiasts or overlapping with this group, there's another subset of people. Many people who are queer, whether they are trans or some other form of genderqueer or whatever it is, we love dinosaurs. Along with being a dinosaur expert, (laughs) Riley is herself transgender. And according to Riley, there is a whole community of genderqueer dinosaur enthusiasts online. Type dinosaur into the LGBT subreddit, Hundreds of results with pride dinos, rainbow dinos, dino moms, dino dads, and a lot of puns. Like Allysaurus. Trans Ceratops. In 2018, the Twitter account for Sue, the T-Rex, one of the world's most famous dinosaurs held at the Field Museum in Chicago, that account updated Sue's bio to include the dinosaur's pronouns. They, them. So... It, it, this, without without the context of what we heard earlier, this would make absolutely no sense. But it, now that I hear this after that context again, it's actually making a lot more sense because they're setting up a false narrative. The narrative they're setting up here is that transgendered people also like dinosaurs. Who knew? I had no idea that people of various genders like dinosaurs. Um, and then the evil turfs are going to come. Right. And they're going to use the dinosaur emoji because they're interested in hurting trans people. That's the way this story is being set up, and that's obviously why they're starting with trans people like dinosaurs. You guys already know the context behind uh, why the feminists dressed up in the dinosaur uniform. Right. And that's a completely different story with a completely different angle, and at this point, NPR is setting up the lie. I'm just I'm just struck by... It, it's, not, it's not mere anthropomorphizing to give a it's it's kind of like a political or ideological anthropomorphization when you give a gender identity of they them to a dinosaur it it's not even in the same species you need another word in there like speciesization or something it just participates in so many fallacies and category mistakes it, it's hard to keep track of them all What's the connection between people who identify as genderqueer and dinosaurs? I am not entirely sure why. This is uh, an aspect of social psychology, I think, that has not been plumbed uh, as yet. Were you using the um, dinosaur emoji relatively frequently before all of this stuff happened? I would use dinosaur emojis for emphasis just to share things I was excited about. I'd use a little dinosaur emoji, a comet emoji, a plant emoji, and a raccoon emoji to kind of tell that story of like the dinosaurs going extinct and plants and mammals coming back afterwards and just having fun like with storytelling. But a few months ago, Riley started to see dinosaur emoji that weren't so fun. I think my initial knee-jerk reaction was just like, well, you can't have them. Like, dinosaurs are ours. The T-Rex and Brachiosaurus were showing up in the profiles of a different online community. They could have picked anything else, and it might have made a little bit more sense to me. So the people who were, the, the women who were putting the dinosaur emojis in their various posts and on Twitter and different places like that were doing it because they wanted to hurt the feelings of Riley, the transgendered <laughs> dinosaur. Evidently, yeah. Well, that's the way the story is being set up, right? They did it. To hurt transgendered people. Right. They're using dinosaurs because the feminists knew for some reason that transgendered people love dinosaurs. That's what NPR is saying right here. That, that's right. That's yeah. exactly what's being said. It's a lot more nefarious once you understand what, what actually happened. Yeah. Riley refers to the group of co-opters as... I get the whole thing is just so... It's not only dishonest, it's just so stupid. 
it's the way this story is stupid. Yeah. The actual original story yeah, about what happened is quite is interesting, quite interesting yeah, yeah. and not stupid. Yeah. This is NPR's version of it is stupid because I guess they had to resort to stupid in order to make a dishonest portrayal of what actually happened. How right, else could you it, twist the story unless it, you come up with something stupid like right, this? Right, and it forwards their narrative. Yeah. Right. Riley refers to the group of co-opters as TERFs, as in T-E-R-F, trans-exclusionary radical feminists, who call themselves, quote, gender critical, in other words, anti-trans. Broadly speaking, TERFs promote the idea that trans women are really men, that unlike cisgender women, trans women have benefited from being a part of the patriarchy and thus are a threat to cis women. Above all, they say that unlike sex, gender identity is an ideology and is not grounded in science. Correct. <laughs> Factually speaking. Yep. You may recall the most famous or infamous person associated with turf ideology is J.K. Rowling, the Harry Potter author. Among other things, in 2020, she published a 3,700-word essay defending her belief that the term woman as a political and biological class was being eroded by people who refer to trans women. Well, if we, since we already know what the story was actually about, uh, listeners and viewers can decide for themselves, but if a journal like The Lancet, which is a pretty prestigious medical journal, refers to women as bodies with vaginas, yeah. I could see where that might be offensive to some people. Maybe not, maybe it is. That's an actual story that we could talk about, but that's what's actually going on. And is denying, is pretending like there is no difference between transgendered women, people who are born male and then transition and become females, is pretending that there is no difference between them and biological women, women that are born female if you don't pretend that, is that anti-trans? Like, do you hate trans people? Like, if, if, I, don't, if I don't pretend like there's no distinction between right. somebody who transitioned to become a woman and somebody who is a woman, if I have to pretend like that's exactly the same thing and I have to pretend like maybe they can get pregnant too, if that's what I have to do, um, if, I, if I refuse to do that, if I just acknowledge the reality that there is a difference between somebody that has a penis and somebody that doesn't, and that difference could manifest in important ways if you, for example, you put them together in prison, as we've right. seen here in the United States, yeah, and you, where there's UK. been women who've been raped. Right. Um, if I don't, if if I refuse to acknowledge that distinction, does that make you somebody, somebody that hates transgendered people? No, because that is what the implication is. That That's is what the they're saying. That's, yeah. That's, and also this attack on J.K. Rowling. First of all, it's despicable. Second of all, it's feeding into this frenzy of hatred against J.K. Rowling for something she never said. It's just, it, it's just dishonest, again, another example of dishonesty. I'll tell you I, what, if somebody refers to my wife, if she goes to a doctor and somebody refers to her as a body with a vagina, I think she's going to be pretty pissed <laughs> off about that. And I think she would have a good reason to be pissed off yeah. about that. And I could see where feminists would have a good reason to be pissed off about that. And maybe you don't agree or maybe you do agree, but let's see a story about that. Why don't yeah, we have a story about exactly. it? Instead, we have to have a stupid story like this, yeah. which doesn't even make any sense without context. As far as NPR is portraying it, feminists decided to use dinosaurs to hurt the feelings of transgendered people. Right. That's I, that's the that's the depth of their story. I, I guess I'm just having trouble. I'm trying to take this seriously, but I just can't take it seriously. It's just too stupid. But yet, uh, it, it's it's a bigger problem than than just a waste of time. It's an abuse of it's power. It's a bigger problem because it's a waste of time. It's abuse and it's dishonest. Right. It's deeply dishonest when you realize what actually happened here. Right. By people who refer to trans women as women. Anyway, TERFs using dinosaur emoji was a problem for Riley. To see, you know, our social enemies, for lack of a better term. Poor Riley is a victim. 100%. Boy. Taking, you know, these symbols and trying to use it as their dog whistle, it really just made zero sense to me. No matter who you are. So again, we have the context of the story. It was the feminists who were insulted by being called dinosaurs by the British MP. He called them dinosaurs. And then they took to wearing a dinosaur costume and used that in protest as a way to kind of deal with that with humor. And it appears to right. have worked. And just as it made no sense to, I can't remember the person's name, it makes no sense to the listeners because there's no context. Yeah, no, why? They're not explaining Why it. are they using dinosaurs? Because they hate trans people. Right. They well, why else would they be dinosaur? using dinosaurs? They're using well, the dinosaur costume because dinosaur was thrown at them uh, by a British politician as a pejorative. Yeah. So they adopted it. 
That's mm. the actual story here. You never know that from listening and to NPR. Had no clue. In fact, when we first heard it, we were completely clueless. No. If you see something beloved taken over by someone else, that can be hard. Suddenly, genderqueer fans of dinos everywhere felt under attack as turfs kept <laughs> dropping the emoji into their feeds. And we know how these things go. Just think of Pepe the Frog or the Punisher skull or the swastika. <laughs> the swastika has to be in there. The swastika in there. <laughs> Gotta have the swastika course, in there. They're not. <laughs> Absolutely. Outsider groups latch onto a symbol. That symbol is often changed irrevocably. It's not clear if TERFs knew they were co-opting something beloved to this slice of the gender queer community. As far as we can tell... It is clear. They adopted the dinosaur costume because they were called dinosaurs. That's why they started wearing the dinosaur costume. This person who is saying this either did absolutely no research and then how they put together the story, I have no idea, or they're lying. Those are your two options here with NPR. Yeah, and also many trans people are gender critical, so it's not necessarily true, like Buck Angel. But right. again, you'd never know any of this from, from listening to it. No. Dinosaur emoji began showing up in anti-trans Twitter bios around October of last year. We're going to skip a, a, a section. Uh, we There's Jerry Bur Burge, B-U-R-G-E. He's the founder of Chief Emoji Officer. It's amazing that there's such a thing at Emojipedia. The bottom line is we're just editing this out for clarity. It actually makes the story better once it's edited out. It becomes cleaner. It has cleaner. nothing to do with, the, with their false narrative or the original story. Y yeah. Yeah. Pointless. All right. Let's continue. Back in October, almost immediately, the community bombarded TERFs with takedowns and messages of trans pride. One tweet seemed to bring this fight out of its bubble. It came from a pro-trans cis woman named Courtney Milan. She's a romance writer, but she also dabbles in creating emoji. And in a blow to the turf community, she tweeted a simple message. Quote, these emoji dinosaurs are both trans. I know this because I wrote the proposal to the Unicode Technical Committee asking for them. The Unicode Consortium doesn't simply make emoji. People propose emoji. It is a very official process. They are technical documents and they are trying to make the case for an emoji, but there's often little uh, over-emphatic language often used about why it's essential this emoji be added and, and what the, the meaning is. Courtney Milan proposed the first set of dinosaurs. You know, that too is dishonest. Yeah. She, when she originally proposed this, we, we looked back and looked at this, there was no mention of the dinosaurs being transgendered. This is something that was done after the fact to help push the narrative. You know, Douglas Murray is right. We, we've just lost bigger things to worry about, so we elevate these idiotic issues and problematize them. We make problems of things that are just... Thousands of people being raped and murdered in Europe right now. And the first land war, first large land war we've had in Europe in a long time. We've got the highest jump in inflation that the country's seen in 30 or 40 years. Yeah. The largest spike in homicide the United States has ever seen, 30% in this last year. And we're talking about dinosaur emojis. Your tax dollars for NPR <laughs> are going to talk about a make-believe story, which is was hobbled together by them to push a false narrative and ignore what the actual story was was about. I think even the actual story, yeah. I don't find to be particularly important. But but that it's right. a real issue. It's something you can. It, it's right. women being upset about being called bodies with vaginas, and then being called a dinosaur because they don't like being called bodies with vaginas. So they wear a dinosaur outfit at a protest. That's what the actual story is about. It's not about feminists hating trans people and adopting trans the dinosaur because they thought tr trans people love the dinosaur. That's just a hundred percent bullshit made right. up story by NPR. So if you looked at a wall and didn't listen to this, you'd be better off because you wouldn't have false information. hundred percent. It's if you, like a revenge story. You would know more about this story <clears throat> having not heard this story from NPR. Correct. Dinosaur emoji back in 2016. A T-Rex, a Brachiosaurus, and a Triceratops. Her proposal is eight pages long, with charts showing how often people search for dinosaur emoji online. It includes potential meanings for the emoji. Courtney was arguing that because she created these dinosaurs, she determined their gender, and she determined that... Okay. I, I don't even know if I... Because she... 
how do you tell the gender of a, dino, a, a dinosaur emoji? <laughs> yeah. Do you have to look at it sideways or how? I mean, how do you, the, the whole concept sure. of pushing a I, that they were transgender? Does Courtney's original proposal say the dinos are in fact trans? No, I didn't see anything in the proposal. No. So, a hint of honesty by NPR. They just threw all that in afterwards, and now they're going to mention it briefly at the end. In the proposal that really makes that case. But that doesn't mean the... How beholden to an ideology do you have to be that you push a gender on a long extinct species, something that's not even in your own species, a long... You, I mean, just, just think of the mindset that someone would have to be in to think, to even think in this way. Well, how weak are your arguments if that's what you're left with? Right. The original creator of the dinosaur emoji says that the dinosaur emoji is transgendered, and that's your evidence for pushing forward whatever, whatever Deranged. appeasal you're trying to push forward. But that doesn't mean the person proposing it can't declare they are. Riley, for her part, wants us to remember that whatever we may think about the gender or sex of dinosaur emoji on Twitter, we should remember that the millions and millions of years of evolution in biological nature on planet Earth tells a story that's a little more nuanced. So we don't know what determined the biological sex of non-avian dinosaurs, as in like Triceratops and T-Rex, the ones that we love that went extinct 66 million years ago. Right. Because we don't have the genetics, so we don't. So the dino emoji is a stand-in for a general category of dinosaur, not a specific dino. That's what an emoji is supposed to be, right? It's supposed to be a generalized stand-in for a category of things. Yeah, and, and I would argue, you know, no matter what you think about the dinosaur emojis, I would argue you're far better off not thinking about the dino, dino emoji. If you're iota. thinking too much about dinosaur emojis, you might want to reevaluate your life. Yeah, if you're thinking at all about dinosaur emojis, there's a deeper problem going on. So we don't know whether it was genetically determined or today, for example, some of their closest living relatives like alligators and crocodiles have temperature dependent sex determination. So the temperature of the nest determines whether more males or females are going to be born. There are some birds. I love how they, uh, if, if biology suits them, they use it, or at least they think that they suits their, suits their argument, they use it. If not, it's categorically disregarded. That might have hormonal shifts during their life that make them present and behave differently. And the relevance there is that it tells us that what we think of as biological sex isn't binary and it's much more malleable than we ever really understood. In other words, in Earth's larger history, non-binary is way more common than people think. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what an astonishing inference. That, and therefore, that that is b based upon at best, it would be the naturalistic fallacy. I don't, let's not even go it's there. Not even it's not even such a stupid because, issue. I guess it's yeah. If you if, if if you have this thing for alligators and like, I mean, the whole. Th I mean, is that the inference that one pulls as a result of this? That non-binary is more in nature than we think. I mean, this is like a, literally listening to this. You would be stupider. As a result. And it's presented as fact. Yeah. Unlike so many other failed attempts to save a symbol, the push against anti-trans use of the dinosaur emoji, it seems to have worked. Hey, they won. Yay. A little happy note at the end. They won this <laughs> crazy battle over dinosaur emojis. Um, I, I, I don't have anything else to say. This was truly... A stupid and idiotic. Well, you know what? Here's the thing. I don't and this personally think that finding yourself offended at the term bodies with vaginas means you hate trans women. I don't think wanting to acknowledge the distinction between biological females and transgendered women makes you someone who hates transgendered women. That's my personal opinion. But there are people who can make that argument a lot better than I can, I'm sure, like J.K. Rowling. And why doesn't NPR have one of them on to actually articulate their point of view and then do a story about that? Because that's really what this is about. Right. The whole transgendered versus turf thing is about language, and it's about people 
being forced to either to pretend that there is no distinction in language and everywhere else. Otherwise, you're going to be called a hater and somebody that hates an entire group of people or a Nazi. And you're going to have subtle little things where the swastika is going to be thrown in stories and by NPR and, and thrown at you. Why not actually have somebody on a feminist or J.K. Rowling or somebody else to articulate your actual point of view to the American people and then have NPR do a story like that? That could have been the story that you heard. Yeah, that would have. Uh... Or they could have just told the truth about this one. Because it was kind of interesting what we heard at first. The yeah, actual was. story yeah. was. Yeah. And instead they have an, a completely false narrative, like Teen Vogue revenge story where, yay, the dinosaur emojis win the day at the end and they're for trans people. And, and actually anybody that heard this story and only heard the NPR version knows less about the topic than they did before they actually pushed play. Yeah, and that's pe people tune in because they want to learn and they want to know. Uh, I'm going to end on this one thing. This is from the Journal of Zoology, quote, sex is fully determined at the time of, of hatching and irreversible thereafter. Well, they played a little shell game if you listen to what they said there. There's like, uh, alligators are non-binary. In other words, alligators can switch back and forth. And then when she actually mentioned it, Riley yes, actually no, talks about, she says- No that, alligator that's been hatched is non-binary. Right, what they said was the temperature in the nest determines whether there's more females or males at birth. Not that once they become male, they can become female or vice versa. Two very different things. But again, there's a there's just a deep level of dishonesty here. Yeah, we'll post the uh, Journal of, of Zoology in the, YouTube, uh, in the YouTube comments. Okay, well, there's another- I feel dumber. Yeah, I, I don't even know what to say about it, so I guess I'll just let it stay on its own. Thanks for watching. If you listen to NPR on a regular basis, you probably believe that Antifa is a, a heroic movement designed to fight fascism and crush it everywhere that it's found. NPR has consistently defended Antifa, and it's created an alternative reality. We're going to take a listen to one of the clips. This is from June 7th, 2020, on NPR's Weekend Edition. Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! Demonstrations in front of the White House have attracted a diverse group of protesters over the last eight days. Students, health workers, clergy, families... On a curb along 16th Street, there's Lacey McCauley. I am a just Washington, D.C. activist, anti-fascist, Antifa. Antifa. Also breaking right now, police warn of an Antifa. A normal person, just like you and me, a normal person going through their daily routine, fighting fascism everywhere it's found. People are so hoodwinked by language. They're so, if Antifa were called something else, like, you know, blooming flowers or something, they would never have gained this much traction. Antifa protest today. Uh, radical militants that are coming out under cover of night, traveling across state lines. And once again, they came to fight, dressed in black, wearing masks, and armed with smoke bombs, shields, and pepper spray. Take a look. That from Fox News. Okay, so NPR has, there's a built-in pathological hatred of Fox. I'm not a Fox listener myself, so I, I say that as a commentator on this. Fox says it. We know Fox is bad, therefore Fox must be wrong. Part of the narrative. Macaulay, who is white, is wearing a tight black shirt and a face covering, but most people are now because of the pandemic. Hers is a black and white paisley bandana. There aren't a lot of people who are public who can explain Antifa who um, are kind of in it. She's 41 and says she's been an active protester since 2003. Protester. And the invasion of Iraq. By 2016, she had focused on Richard Spencer and counter-demonstrated at his deadly Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia in August 2017. He's a white nationalist and a eugenicist and everything. Okay, so Richard Spencer, who's a horrible human being, is a white nationalist. If we fight Richard Spencer, therefore Antifa is good. That's the broad narrative that, that they're painting so far. And um, that is what I... Uh, was doing when some, you know, right-wing people uh, decided to basically uh, find me. Most Antifa are anonymous, but the group Project Veritas filmed Macaulay in 2017, publicizing her name and contact information. She says she got death threats, that there was a mysterious fire at her home, and so for the past few years, to protect her family, she's not spoken publicly. 
She says people misunderstand what Antifa is. Anti-fascism is more like a set of practices and a philosophy than it is an organization. No, uh, actually, we, we don't have any kind of like big giant hierarchy. It comes from your heart. It comes from your sense of justice. That's real. That's what's real. What are the principles and tenets of this? So, so what comes from your heart? Like, what are the, so tell me some things that Antifa believes without using the word fascism. What are some of the actions that you believe are ethically justifiable? Like, I, I would have asked her some, some pretty basic questions like that. The Justice Department has a different understanding. We have evidence that Antifa and other similar extremist groups, as well as actors of a variety of different political uh, persuasions, have been involved in instigating and participating in the violent activity. That's Attorney General William Barr on Thursday, name-checking only Antifa. According to the Anti-Defamation League, far-left Antifa has its roots in 1960s Europe, and the belief, shared by some right-wing thinkers, that if German civilians had been armed and violent in the 1920s and 30s, the Nazis would have never come to power. The ADL says Antifa's embrace of violence can be self-defeating, but notes that there have been no murders related to Antifa in the U.S., well, that's interesting. So this aired June 2020, and less than eight weeks later, Michael Reinhold of Antifa murdered uh, a man downtown Portland. And he then went up to Lacey, Washington. There was a federal manhunt. He fired at the federal officers and was killed in a gun battle. And that's just one of many examples. But we've had thousands of police officers injured by Antifa. Since the BLM movement started and the George Floyd protest started, we've had about four dozen people murdered. There's been billions in property damage. So yeah. there's a lot to unpack here. Yeah. Uh, and, and what NPR is doing, the, the clips that we've heard previously, a lot of them are kind of stupid and misleading. This is dangerous because they're carrying water for a violent terrorist organization. And Lacey, no matter how she likes to portray herself when she dresses up in black and justifies the fact that she's about to go out and commit property crimes or hurt people, there is no excuse for that. And it's kind of shameful that you hear that on this, but let's see if they push back on yeah, it. And all. again, that's the thing, the pushback. The there pushback. won't be any. Okay. So what... Again, simple questions like, oh, well, what kind of things are acceptable if you're an anti-fascist? Is it acceptable to... When is it acceptable to take the law in your own hands yeah. and act as a vigilante and go out in a group of people and mob other people, as we've seen here in Portland? Elderly people, young people, they're weak people in general. They get together in a group and then they'll attack anybody that they find who's on their own. That's who these people are. Mm. You know, we had many federal officers that were hurt when all that happened, including blinded by lasers right. to the eye. That's who NPR right. is carrying water for right now. That's who these people are. People yeah. need to understand that. Yeah, and I would really like to know, okay, so let's, let's have an honest conversation. You feel this in your heart. So what do you feel in your heart is acceptable to do? Is it acceptable to knock down statues without going through a democratic process? Is it acceptable to burn corporate buildings to the ground like Starbucks. Is that morally acceptable to accomplish your cause? I mean, how about some basic questions instead of letting somebody run roughshod when they tell you something is in their heart? If something is in someone's heart and something else is in someone else's heart, that's not a reason. You can't adjudicate that. You need to, to figure out why you're doing what you're doing and if it's ethically justifiable, if, if the confidence you have in the, these moral conclusions are justified by the evidence you have for them. But there's none of that. And most domestic terrorism in the U.S. is linked to right-wing extremists. Southern Poverty Law Center for a long time had black nationalists listed and white nationalists listed. And the black nationalists far outnumbered the white nationalists and they took it off because that was problematic for their ideology. And there's plenty of violence on both the left and the right. So and, to say it's right wing is, is and, misleading And the SPLC has been, I'm delighted that they lost their lawsuit with Majit Nawaz. The SPLC is largely a, a woke propaganda machine. They're discredited, but they still have legitimacy among a certain segment of the population who then pulls from that database and says, look, these are what th this is what the, da the data shows. Now, that doesn't mean there are no right wing extremist organizations, but it's, again, this idea to paint Antifa. And again, it's just genius marketing, anti-fascist. Who is an anti-fascist? Who wouldn't be anti-fascist? Lisa McCauley is six months pregnant and has a toddler in a stroller with her, and she supports the use of force. In pretty much every, you know, people's uprising, 
you're going to see, uh, you know, rioting and looting and everyday people destroying the symbols of power. You know what? They're not rioting and looting in Lacey's neighborhood, I don't think. Yeah. When they burned down the police station in Minneapolis, the people that paid for that were the poor, working, mostly black people who live in that neighborhood in Minneapolis. And the homicides had the highest spike in homicides we've ever seen in a year since the recorded history of the United States. Most of those victims were black, and she's not going to be the one to pay for that. That's what's kind of disgusting about it. They're not kind of disgusting. It is disgusting yeah. about this. She's justifying rioting and, lo rioting and looting. Whose neighborhood are they rioting and looting right. in? Right. I, I want to take a second to talk about, you know, she supports the use of force and she talks about taking down the symbols of power. This is, I don't know what her education is or what her background is, but we know where this ideology has come from. We know the source. We know that there are training institutions. Our universities have become these. They're teaching people that this, it's the system. It's, that's the key word. It's the system. It's always the system. Um, all right, let, let's let's keep. Wait, you know, on that point, though, I also say there's like there's three types, major types of violent predators, right? There's the interpersonal violence that happens between people, um, and that is the most common form of violence, and that's going to be most of the assaults and homicides and rapes. Then there's violent criminal actors who make a living being criminal actors and cause violence in the process. And you write about this in your book, The Gift of Violence. And the third category is moralistic violence yeah. where people are committing violence for political reasons terrorist organizations she is of that category Correct. now the majority the, the the minority of violence most of the time is that moralistic criminal actors but when they do act they commit more harm than virtually anybody else and every single one of them thinks that they're on the right side of history they think that that they're in their heart, they're doing what's right. right. But there's a reason why we don't let people run around and shoot other people or burn down neighborhoods because they feel it in their heart. Right. Lacey hasn't figured that out yet. Yeah, P P Stephen Pinker writes about that when he says it's not that people are bad people, it's that they're hyper-moral. Their sense of morality is over-activated. That causes them to do... Uh, I, I disagree with that a little bit. If her sense of morality really was hyperactivated, she'd burn down her own neighborhood. She wouldn't go burn down some <laughs> poor black person's neighborhood. Right. So I think she's a bit of a hypocrite. But I'm sure that it makes her feel good to think that she's LARPing as a hero. Yeah, and I bet you it's, it's, it's key to her sense of personal identity. No doubt. Yeah. I mean, we've seen arrests of people self-describing as Antifa, anti-fascists, or other sort of you know, under the leftist anarchist banner, you know, that have been armed in some places. Um, there have been accusations that they are involved, at least in some sense, in sort of the violence against property. What would you, what would you say to that? Uh, I think that, you know, I'm not very interested in talking about looting um, or the smashing of windows compared to the actual loss of human life that Black people are experiencing every single week, every single day in this country. And what have, what has been the results of what Lacey has engaged in over the last couple of years? This was 2020. What has happened in the last two years in the black community? The largest single spike in violence this right. country has ever seen. I was just going to ask her, like, okay, that, that's really interesting. Like, what would be an example right. of that? Everything she's done has had the opposite effect. Right, it's contributed to the very thing that she is saying that she's fighting exactly. against. Exactly. Literally everything. This is why you're gonna have 87, 86% of the, of the black community in those, in those high crime neighborhoods want more police presence. And you're gonna have, we've had this here in Portland, where they were burning down the Albina neighborhood, and they oh, burned yeah. down some black owned businesses. And they're, and they're all a bunch of wealthy white kids out pretending to be heroes, burning down these neighborhoods, and it's the poor working class people, small business owners in that neighborhood are begging for them to leave because those white kids aren't gonna be the one that gets shot there. Right. I think that that's what we need just to keep focusing on. We've seen over the past few days that the protests have become a lot less violent with a lot less confrontation. <laughs> So, like I said, just a few weeks later, there was a homicide here in Portland committed by an Antifa member, and that violence hasn't stopped. It still goes on in this city. It right. still goes on and, in quite a few. And did you see the video after that of that? They're getting around as I swear not to. Where's another fascist right. pig? I have not said that a fucking fascist died tonight. <laughs> Fuck the protests have become a lot less violent with a lot less confrontation confrontation and that seems to be a deliberate tactic that 
is being developed in some places. Uh, is that something that someone from Antifa could embrace? Anti-fascists actually protest, uh, quote unquote, peacefully, like. <laughs> oh, I, we don't even need to comment no. on that one. When it's actually be effective to do so. Remember, uh, people of color have been protesting against oppression in this country for, for decades and centuries. And um, has anyone listened? Like, I mean, only, you know, people are listening right now, but. Uh, Did she sleep through the civil rights movement? Right. Yeah. Right. Did they accomplish that by burning down neighborhoods? Has she not noticed the massive progress that's occurred over the decades? She's not been part of it. She's part of the problem. She's not part right. of the solution. And I would have said, look, give me an example of that. Like, let's talk about what are some specific examples of that. If uh, that police station had never been burned down, would we be talking about this right now in Washington, D.C.? Macaulay says she's decided to speak out now because of the administration's focus on Antifa. Donald Trump absolutely would love to see all of us in jail. She belongs in jail. She should be in jail. She, she belongs in jail. He would love to see all of us political refugees in another country or persecuted into silence. No, not persecuted into silence. You're free to say whatever you want. Just don't assault people. Don't loot. Don't destroy. Don't destroy property. Nobody's persecuting you for a political opinion. Hey, if Lacey wants to destroy property, I say go for it, Lacey. Just use your property. Right. Don't go after some other poor person's right. property. Hey, burn your own stuff down. Right. Have at it. No, nobody's quelching anybody's speech. And if you can start with a group like Antifa that is actually like not very well organized or anything like that, well, you can label everyone Antifa. Actually, no. That was Lacey McCauley, an Antifa protester in Washington. Protester. A pr protester who advocates for, for looting and su supports the use of force. You know, that's the other thing. I remember when the rioting was going on, and I, I looked at two Twitter feeds from local news stations, and they would always call these crazy riots of assault uh, on police officers, assault on property, assaulting people. They'd always call it protesting. Right. It, and it's, it's not just protesting. so dishonest. Right. I mean, just... Describe the phenomenon for what it is by using the appropriate words. And Don't who are they fighting? They're fighting working class people. You, it doesn't get much more working class than law enforcement. Right. They're fighting working class people. And in most of those cities like Chicago and Baltimore and places like that, even here in Portland, probably half the police force, if not more, is black or Hispanic. The chief, and the chief these, of police is black. Yeah. yeah usually the, the former chief of police is black. And, and, and yeah, these yeah. guys are out there trying to protect the neighborhood and protect people and they're being assaulted and attacked by terrorists like Lacey and you've got a taxpayer funded exactly institution like NPR carrying water for these exactly people and it's correct. absolutely disgraceful thank you for joining us for today's episode of all things reconsidered we'll reconsider more next time so subscribe on YouTube and Substack you can find links in the description and at peterbogosian.com at the website, you can also get a t-shirt, tote bag, or sticker that will surely be a conversation starter. This swag is being sold to you at cost. We don't make a profit on these products, but the world may profit when you start a conversation about what in the world happened to NPR. We'll see you next week. This episode of All Things Reconsidered is supported by The Sound Syllogism, your source for true premises and valid conclusions. Visit peterbogosian.com to learn more.